Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Brown. I'm director of the CLL Center at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston. And today I'll be speaking to you about acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib in CLL. These are my disclosures. Now, as you know, there are a variety of BTK inhibitors in clinical development now. And the focus of this talk is the next generation covalent inhibitors, namely acalabrutinib and xanabrutinib both of which are much more specific for BTK than abrutinib itself. I will not be speaking about the non-covalent inhibitors, which are in earlier phase trials, largely attempting to address resistance to covalent inhibitors. Now, here you can see the kinome selectivity amongst the three drugs of interest today. Abrutinib on the right has activity against quite a few kinases. Xanabrutinib, fewer on the left, and you can see acalabrutinib is the most specific of the three covalent BTK inhibitors. That's illustrated further here. Acalabrutinib has no activity against ITK, minimal activity against TEC, and no activity at all against EGFR. So this should reduce side effects. Now in the first phase 1b2 study, 134 CLL patients were enrolled with a median age of 66 and two prior therapies. You can see 23% had deletion 17P, 18% 11Q, and almost three quarters unmutated IGHV. The progression-free survival in this relapse refractory setting is shown here with somewhat worse curves for deletion 17P and complex karyotype compared to all patients or 11Q, very similar to what we've seen with abrutinib, albeit still with shorter follow-up. A component of this study also involved monotherapy acalabrutinib in treatment naive CLL. And in this expansion phase, patients were randomized between 100 milligrams twice per day or 200 milligrams daily. BTK occupancy was carefully studied in both of these cohorts. And you'll note that while it's high with all doses, the 100 milligram BID dose maintains even tighter BTK occupancy at trough as well as four hour post dose compared to 200 milligrams daily. And that's how 100 milligrams BID became the dose of a calibrutinib that we now use. This study is also impressive because in this treatment naive cohort, the 48 month event free survival is 90%. And after 53 months, 86% of patients remain on therapy. So this compares to in Resonate 2 with a brutinib, 41% of patients discontinuing for adverse events at the five year mark. So really a marked difference in discontinuation due to adverse events, which here with the calibrutinib was only 6% at four years. Overall response and duration of response were also both 97%, demonstrating now with long-term follow-up the efficacy of this drug. Now this of course led to two different registrational trials. The first to be reported was a SEND in relapse refractory CLL, in which patients were randomized between a calibrutinib 100 milligrams twice per day, or investigator choice of adelalisib rituximab or bendamustine rituximab. And the randomization was stratified by deletion 17P, ECOG, and number of prior therapies. Patient demographics, median age in the late 60s, one to two prior therapies, about 15% deletion 17P, but 80% unmutated IGVH and 30% complex karyotype. We can see that in the final analysis of the trial, investigator assessed progression-free survival was markedly improved for calibrutinib compared to the combined arms of adelisib rituximab and bendamustine rituximab as shown on the left. And as shown on the right, you can see that the BR and the adelisib rituximab arms had pretty similar overlapping PFS. And in fact, the one year PFS for the acalabrutinib monotherapy arm was about 88%, so quite good. Interestingly, there was no difference in the acalabrutinib arm for patients who had 17P or P53 mutation as shown on the left, or for those with unmutated IGHV. And it will be interesting to see if this holds up with longer follow-up. In terms of disposition, it is important to note that the patients on a calibrutinib were on drug for a median of 22 months at time of analysis, adelisib rituximab for only 11 and a half months, and BR for 5.6 months. 16% of patients discontinued a calibrutinib for an adverse event compared to 
of adelocibrituximab patients. 10% for progressive disease with acalabrutin and 14% with adelocibrituximab. Now, in terms of incidence of events of clinical interest, this was the first randomized trial reported of acalabrutinib, so this was quite interesting. And you'll see there is 6% atrial fibrillation with acalabrutinib versus 3% in control, but the median exposure was more than double. There is increase in low-grade bleeding, but major hemorrhage is about the same, hypertension about the same, infections about the same. In fact, infections were higher, grade 3 infections, particularly in the adelocyp or tuximab. Second primary malignancies may be a few more with the acalabrutinib, I think we'll need longer follow-up to see if this is drug-related or really it, it may be more disease-related. Then the next registration trial to be reported at ASH last year was Elevate Treatment Naive. This was in treatment naive CLL patients over the age of 65 or under 65 with comorbid medical conditions. They were stratified by deletion 17P, ECOG, or geographic region and randomized between acalabrutinib abinutuzumab, acalabrutinib single agent, or obinutuzumab chlorambicil. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival assessed by the IRC comparing acalabrutinib obinutuzumab to obinutuzumab chlorambicil. Patient characteristics showed a population about the age of 70. About 10% had 17P deletion, and they were about two to two and a half years from diagnosis. These are the progression-free survival results. You can see the acalabrutin of binutuzumab arm showed a 90% improvement compared to binutuzumab chlorambicil and a 93% two-year PFS. Acalabrutin in monotherapy had an 87% two-year PFS, 80% improvement over binutuzumab chlorambicil. The 6% difference between acalabrutinib and acalabrutinib binutuzumab is intriguing. The study was not powered to detect this difference, although there is a trend toward significance with it. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens over time. With this. When we look at the IRC assessed benefit across subgroups, interestingly, the one subgroup that had relatively diminished benefit from single agent acalabrutinib was the mutated IGHV patients, whereas the addition of abinutuzumab resulted in a marked benefit. And in fact, most of the 6% difference in progression free survival between those two arms is actually in mutated IGHV patients. The unmutated patients have overlapping curves which is perhaps interesting about the biology of mutated IGVH patients, that it may be the case that deeper remissions are more beneficial to them. In terms of events of clinical interest in this study, atrial fibrillation was 3 to 4% in each of the acalabrutinib arms versus 0.6% in abinutuzumab chlorambicil, again, with a median exposure of about 28 months for acalabrutinib versus 6 months for abinutuzumab chlorambicil. So hard to say whether there's really a difference there. Hypertension, about the same really. Low grade bleeding, about the same in the two acalabrutinib arms, but certainly higher than abinutuzumab chlorambicil. No difference in major bleeding. Infections are somewhat increased in the acalabrutinib arms, but were generally manageable. And same comment with second primary malignancies as we saw in the prior study. So we don't yet have a head-to-head -head trial of acalabrutinib versus abrutinib. We do have a pooled safety analysis of nine trials from the spring meetings showing that low-grade hemorrhage does happen in up to half of patients, major hemorrhage in about three and a half percent. Atrial fibrillation is 4%, which certainly appears lower than what we've seen with abrutinib. And there was one case of a ventricular tachyarrhythmia amongst over a thousand patients. Hypertension was 7.6% in the overall population. There has been a study looking at acalabrutinib amongst patients who had discontinued abrutinib for adverse events. And some of those data are summarized here. You can see that amongst the 16 patients who discontinued for atrial fibrillation, three had recurrence on acalabrutinib, all lower severity. Arthralgia and rash all seem to show a lower rate of recurrence on acalabrutinib but the diarrhea and bleeding look about the same. These patients were all fairly sick, and I think the data are generally encouraging that in many cases, if a patient stops abrutinib for a side effect, you can consider transitioning to a calabrutinib. But ultimately, we're all waiting for this head-to-head -head study comparing a calabrutinib to abrutinib, the Elevate Relapse Refractory Study. And this study is just waiting on events. 
Now, in terms of moving forward with the calibrutinib, Navarre institution has been doing a phase two study of the triple combination of a calibrutinib, venetoclaxin, and venetuzumab for initial therapy of CLL. One month lead in of a calibrutinib, two months of a venetuzumab with the calibrutinib, and then venetoclax started at month three and continued for 12 months to the primary endpoint evaluation, which is complete remission with bone marrow, undetectable MRD. Patients who do not meet those criteria can continue to 24 months. We presented preliminary data at ASH last year of 37 patients. These are generally high-risk patients, 60% unmutated, over a quarter with TP53 aberrancy, another 30% with 11Q deletion. Efficacy is very preliminary, but looks quite encouraging. At cycle 16, 75% had undetectable MRD in bone marrow and 87.5% in blood, but only eight patients were valuable at that point. And we will be reporting updated data at ASH this year. This has served as the basis for an international multicenter phase three trial comparing three arms, a calibrutinib venetoclax, a calibrutinib venetoclax of venetuzumab, each given for 14 months to FCR or BR in treatment naive patients with active CLL stratified by age, IGHV, rise stage, and geographic region. So we look forward to the results of this study. Now turning our attention to xanabrutinib, again, more specific than abrutinib, does not inhibit EGFR, does not inhibit ITK, but it does inhibit tech. So bleeding risk may be roughly similar with xanabrutinib and abrutinib. It has an interesting PK profile in that the drug is maintained in plasma throughout the entire 12 hour dosing interval as shown on the left, whereas abrutinib clears before its 24 hour redose interval and a calibrutinib clears quite quickly within about six hours as shown here. So the dose exposure of xanabrutinib is much higher, which would help for example with BTK resynthesis. That's further illustrated here, exposure of xanabrutinib in purple compared to abrutinib on the left to calibrutinib on the right. This translates to very high BTK occupancy in PBMCs as shown at the top compared to the display downward that we see with abrutinib in the two lower panels. And also in lymph nodes, complete and sustained BTK inhibition in lymph nodes. And interestingly, the BID dosing of xanabrutinib, 160 milligrams BID, which is the dose that has been most studied, leads to 100% occupancy at trough versus the 320 QD dose, only 94% occupancy at trough, which I think is a rationale to stick with the BID. So the phase 1B trial of xanabrutinib enrolled a variety of indolent and aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphoma patients. The CLL patients included 123 patients, and these data were updated at ASH last year. 98 remained on study. It was primarily a relapsed refractory population, but some treatment naive. 25 were off study, 15 for PD and five for adverse events. Median follow-up about 30 months. Median age of the patients was 67. Median prior therapies in the relapsed patients was two. About 16% had deletion 17P. Adverse events of interest look very similar to your typical BTK inhibitor. When we look at grade three, we see the second primary malignancies in neutropenia primarily. Low grade bruising, of course, quite common. In terms of adverse events of interest, we do see perhaps more neutropenia reported with this drug early on, although my personal experience in that regard has been favorable. Otherwise, you can see infections were fairly steady over the first two years, although the pneumonias went down. Best response over time showed a reduction progressively in partial responses with lymphocytosis and an improvement in CRs up to 15% at three years, which is really quite good in a relapsed refractory population. Progression-free survival shown here is 95% in the treatment naive and 91% in the relapsed refractory at two years. So again, quite encouraging, but relatively shorter follow-up. The Sequoia study is a randomized registration trial in treatment naive CLL. The majority of the patients are enrolled to a comparison of xanabrutinib single agent versus bendamustine rituximab. But cohort two includes deletion 17P patients who are treated with single agent xanabrutinib continuously. And data on this cohort were reported at ASH last year, and I will show you the data. And then finally, another cohort's been added and is enrolling to treat 17P patients with xanabrutinib plus venetoclax. 
So patient disposition for the 17P cohort, 109 patients enrolled, all available. Five were off study treatment, one for an adverse event, and four for progressive disease and a median follow-up of 10 months. Demographics, median age 70, about 22 months since diagnosis, 40% Binet C. 34% had concomitant 11Q deletion, 62% unmutated. Adverse events of interest here, we do see somewhat more infections, neutropenia, again, not surprising, low-grade bruising and bleeding. Grade three higher and serious adverse events were only seen in 37% of patients, which is really rather favorable. And much of this was cytopenic. Progression-free survival is shown here. Overall response rate was 93%, including two complete responses. Four patients had progressive disease with one confirmed Richter's. Now the Alpine study is a head-to-head -head registration trial in relapse refractory CLL comparing xanabrutinib and anabrutinib. And this is ongoing awaiting events. There is, however, a head-to-head -head trial in Waldenstrom's comparing abrutinib to xanabrutinib. And this, on the subject of adverse events, demonstrated a favorable profile for xanabrutinib with much reduced atrial fibrillation at 2% as opposed to 15%, reduced hypertension, edema, contusion, pneumonia much lower despite higher neutropenia, which again is usually manageable with some growth factor if needed. Discontinuation due to adverse events was also half with xanabrutinib and so no reason not to expect similar data with CLL, I think. Now, what about resistance to these drugs? So the Ohio State Group reported their experience at ASH last year of 16 acalabrutinib progressors, 11 had C481 mutations, two also PLCG2. So looking like the most common mechanism of resistance, similar to what we see with abrutinib. They did screen 103 patients who did not have clinical progression and found 22 who had mutations at a median of 32 months. And the median time to relapse after a mutation for those patients was 12 months. But very similar to data they've reported with a brutinib previously. And you'll note in the graph that actually, interestingly, they see a higher incidence of mutations amongst those who were intolerant to brutinib and crossed over to a calibrutinib. Reasons for that, not entirely clear and also yet to be confirmed in another group. Now, xanabrutinib, we had some data from the Australians at ASH last year about progression, four progressors, all of whom had a novel BTK mutation, LU528 trip. All four also had BTK C481 mutations at a lower variant allele frequency. So the median for the leucine detryptophan mutation was 35% versus the cysteine mutation was 9%. And they did demonstrate that this mutation potentially appeared to block binding of xanabrutinib. They found it also in three out of 34 screen patients at a median of 40 months. So perhaps an intriguing different mechanism of resistance that we will learn more about in the coming years. So in summary, acalabrutinib has demonstrated high efficacy and tolerability with a 90% event-free survival in a frontline cohort at four years, consistent with its more specific effect on BTK. The randomized ASCEND and Elevate trials have led to its full approval by the FDA for CLL patients in any line of therapy, and it has largely become my first choice BTK inhibitor for CLL patients at this point based on its enhanced tolerability and now four-year follow-up. Head-to-head -head data against abrutinib are pending from Elevate relapse refractory. Xanabrutinib has also demonstrated high efficacy and tolerability at shorter follow-up with a progression-free survival greater than 90% in treatment naive and relapse refractory cohorts at 24 months. The dedicated deletion 17P cohort shows overall response rate of 93% with only four progressions. And as you know, xanabrutinib has received accelerated approval in mantle cell lymphoma, but registration trials are ongoing in CLL frontline and relapse refractory cohorts. And the latter trial is head-to-head -head versus abrutinib. But data from Waldenstrom's in a head-to-head -head trial did demonstrate an improved adverse event profile compared to abrutinib. Finally, it will be interesting to see if these drugs result in novel resistant mechanisms, and there is some evidence to that effect now with xanabrutinib. So thank you very much for your attention today.